Good morning, folks. How are you doing? Today is the 11th day of January 2024. It is the first day of the two-day hearings that are taking place in The Hague to address South Africa's application uh, for uh, censuring, basically, Israel for violating uh, the Convention Against uh, Genocide from 19, I think it was, 51. Um, they're bringing charges of genocide against uh, the state of Israel, not the people of Israel, not the nation of Israel, but the government of Israel, based on what's happening in Gaza. Uh, this isn't a vitally important uh, global event taking place, not only because the actions taken by the International Criminal Justice, the uh, a Court of Justice, uh, the uh, ruling that they issue will have the potential to bring about UN Security Council resolutions and um, immediate halt to Israel's aggression inside of Gaza. Uh, not only is that potential potentially uh, an outcome of this, but there's something much larger at stake here. And that is the recognition of international law when it comes to something as basic as our shared humanity rejecting one nation committing an act of genocide against another. This is vitally important, not just for what's happening now, but also for the future. The Israeli ambassador to the UN yesterday gave a speech because they were so concerned about what's happening today in The Hague. And during that speech, part of his argument was that it is reprehensible that the Jewish state would be brought up on charges of violating this Convention Against Genocide in light of the fact that when it was created in the first place, it was created because of the genocide against the Jews. Ergo, how dare anybody bring up this potential, the, the idea that they would commit genocide against someone else because the whole thing was created for them in the first place. First of all, that is a ridiculous argument. It doesn't matter who or why the thing was, uh, was, was brought about in the first place. It only matters what's happening now. And the letter of the law, the international law, that it represents. The second thing that makes this a laughable argument, and one that denotes the arrogance of these Zionists themselves, and that is they honestly believe that they were the only ones that this genocide, that the genocide of the Nazis targeted, when in fact there were numbers of types of people, the Roma, the, 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 the socialists, um, all, all sorts of individuals, and all sorts of um, nationalities, I guess, or types of individuals, homosexuals were also rounded up. The disabled were also rounded up. Um, lots of folks, not just Jewish individuals, but of course, to the Israelis or to the Zionist Israelis, they had, you know, represent them in the United Nations. The only ones that mattered were Jewish. <laughs> this is um, a case not only for what's happening now, but for how we as a people, we as a species, how uh, we'll, we'll view international law in the future and what it means. It's important also to note that the International Court of Justice um, and the International Criminal Court are two separate entities entirely. Um, the International Court of Justice was founded in 1945, 46, the International Criminal Court was founded in 2002. 
The, the, the International Court of Justice addresses issues of states uh, and brings charges, uh, various charges against uh, states. The International Criminal Court brings charges against individuals. We created the International Criminal Court in 2002 because we wanted, as the global war of terror was taking shape, we wanted to be able to bring cases against individuals in a uh, setting that we controlled uh, so that we could demonize them and create the perception that people needed to go. People like Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Bashir al-Assad. Um, these are the kinds of cases of uh, Daniel Ortega, uh, 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 Recep Erdogan, uh, Vladimir Putin, for example. For example, um, these are the people that we wanted to remove. We brought up trumped up charges from the International Criminal Court because they were our fucking puppet. They were our fucking tool. The International Court of Justice is different. I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to play for you, and this is. We are already making the case that South Africa's uh, argument, South Africa's 84-page document and application um, is flawed, that there is no genocide taking place in Gaza. This is absolutely 100% wrong, based entirely on our subservient subservience to the individuals who run this country and their alliance with the Zionists in the Zionist regime in Israel. 100%. It is clearly a case of genocide. Genocidal statements have been made by people in government in Israel, as well as many people outside of government, in terms of the media, in terms of just uh, individuals, in terms of business leaders, all sorts of, con all sorts of statements have been made. Uh, proving that this is a genocide that they want to take place in. And even the white paper that I covered when it, when it first came out, the one that was written on October the 11th by the Ministry of Intelligence, laid out three possible ways for this whole thing to go with, 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 with Hamas and with Gaza. And the one that they, and the, and the third suggestion that they had was, and the one that they recommended was, and the one that they said was going to prove, provide the best outcome for Israel, is indeed genocide. The removal of the Palestinian population from Hamas, from Gaza, forcing them into tent cities and the Sinai Peninsula. And then the taking of Gaza, the taking of the territory by Israel. That, by definition, is genocide. <laughs> the 84-page document is one of the best, most well-written that I've read, and I'm still in the process of going through it. Um, it makes a beautiful case. Strong arguments. I'm going to play for you. Now, I watched a bit of the actual live stream from the ICJ. Uh, the first day, I guess, now, uh, the first uh, sec segment of it was the case being presented by South Africa. I believe tomorrow they will make the case. Uh, Israel will make their case. And goodness, good luck with that. Um, I'm going to play for you uh, in this video one individual. Her name is Adela Hassim. Um, and she is going to make the case on the genocidal acts. Now, while this is happening, there'll be a link to this stuff down below, and you can go watch it yourself. The, the, the presentation for South Africa uh, so far is three hours and 40-some minutes. Her case, her, her part of this is much shorter, but I'm going to play as much of it as I can before I'm concerned that my computer is going to be uh, full up and, and it's not, not going to continue recording. But she makes an amazing case. And you can follow along if you choose to. Um, it's here. You can follow along if you choose to uh, by following the link that I provide here. Uh, 
Uh, this is the application. And then when you get to that link, you click on the, you scroll down, there's two press releases, and then there's the actual application, and then there's another press release. You click on the application, and you find the actual application, all 84 pages here. And this, uh, the facts section, part three, introduction, this is where she's going to be working from. Um, and it makes a very strong case. There is no fucking question. Before we start, I want you to understand who we're talking about. Uh, these are the judges of the uh, International Court of Justice, otherwise known as the World Court, not to be confused with the ICC. Um, as you see, President Donahue is the head of it. And you have, uh, but then again, the vice president is from Russia. Donahue is from the United States. Then you have a representative from China, France, Australia, Brazil, Germany, India, Jamaica, Japan, Lebanon, and Morocco, Slovakia, Slo uh, Slovakia, Slovakia uh, Somalia, and of course Uganda. So this is the; these are the judges, and uh, there's a good. I posted a link to this on my website from Al Jazeera. It's a quick guide to South Africa's. International Court of Justice case against Israel. I've got another uh, article here about it. And then I pushed the link to the um, genocide prevention thing here. Uh, so you can see that for yourself. That you can, this, which is this link here. Okay. Um, so without too much more ado, uh, I'm going to present for you, I'm going to give to you uh, her presentation. Uh, I think she is Dr. Uh, Adela Hassim. Um, and we'll watch them come in to the court. Uh, and then we'll fast forward to Dr. Hassim's presentation. That's the South African delegation. And that's the Israeli side. Okay. Okay, so this is how it started. Let me show you uh, her presentation. Please be seated. Exceptional importance. It's a case. Megan Dugaitubi, Professor John Dugat, Ms. Blin Lecron, Mr. Max Dupris, and Professor Vaughan Lowe. Dr. Adila Asim, Senior Counsel, will provide an overview of the risk of genocidal acts in the perpetual vulnerability to acts of genocide. Mr. Tembekan Dugaitobi, senior counsel, will examine Israel's alleged genocidal intent. Professor John Dugat, senior counsel, will focus on the prima facie jurisdiction. Distinguished member. His Excellency, Mr. Lamola, and I now invite Ms. Adila has seemed to address the court. You have the floor, madam. Okay, so I'm also going to do a video on uh, Dr. Lowe's presentation, which I thought was outstanding. Thank you. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear on behalf of the Republic of South Africa in this case of exceptional importance. It's a case that underscores the very essence of our shared humanity as expressed 
in the preamble to the Genocide Convention. It's my task to address the court on the genocidal acts that have led to this urgent request for provisional measures under Article 41 of the Statute of the Court. South Africa contends that Israel has transgressed Article 2 of the Convention by committing actions that fall within the definition of genocide. The actions show a systematic pattern of conduct from which genocide can be inferred. Allow me to place these acts in context. Gaza is one of the two constituent territories of the occupied Palestinian territories, <coughs> occupied by Israel since 1967. It is a narrow strip of approximately 365 square kilometers as depicted in the map now displayed. Israel continues to exercise control over the space, territorial waters, land crossings, water, electricity, electromagnetic sphere, and civilian infrastructure in Gaza, as well as over key governmental functions. As the Honorable Minister has said, entry and exit by air and sea to Gaza is prohibited with Israel operating the only two crossing points. Gaza, which is one of the most densely populated places in the world, is home to approximately 2.3 million Palestinians, almost half of them children. For the past 96 days, Israel has subjected Gaza to what has been described as one of the heaviest conventional bombing campaigns in the history of modern warfare. Palestinians in Gaza are being killed by Israeli weaponry and bombs from air, land, and sea. They are also at immediate risk of death by starvation, dehydration, and disease as a result of the ongoing siege by Israel, the destruction of Palestinian towns, the insufficient aid being allowed through to the Palestinian population, and the impossibility of distributing this limited aid while bombs fall. This conduct renders essentials to life unobtainable. At this provisional measures stage, as this court has made clear in the Gambia Myanmar case, it is not necessary for the court to come to a final view on the question of whether Israel's conduct constitutes genocide. It is necessary to establish only whether at least some of the acts alleged are capable of falling within the provisions of the convention. On analyzing the specific and ongoing genocidal acts complained of, it is clear that at least some, if not all of these acts, fall within the Convention's provisions. These acts are documented in detail in South Africa's um, application and confirmed by reliable, often UN, sources. It's thus unnecessary and impossible for me to recount all of them. I will highlight only some in order to illustrate the pattern of genocidal conduct. Let me pause it for one second just to make sure we all understand something. Um, neither the ICC or the ICJ have the authority to bring out uh, to, to impose um, punishment themselves. Uh, in the case of the ICC, they have less because they, but they, they're both out of the United Nations and they are both housed in The Hague. However, they are vastly different creatures. What they are hoping for in this case, 
is a favorable ruling for South Africa against Israel will mandate uh, immediate hearing in the UN Security Council uh, to bring about resolutions to force these changes and these uh, uh, things that they, they, they there's, there's eight resolutions that they are seeking uh, with this. And of course, the UN Security Council will then have the authority to mandate these things. Of course, the ceasefire being the first and foremost. And there are others involved. Here's how it's different than bringing a resolution to the UN Security Council through the UN General Assembly um, and that process. In this case, if there is a favorable ruling for the International Criminal I mean, the Court of Justice, uh, it is not something that the United States will be able to veto because it has been ruled on by this body, which is part of the United Nations. Uh, there is no veto option for any nation uh, within the fucking UN Security Council. These things will have to be done. And of course, the UN Security Council will have to vote on them, but they will still it will have to be done. There's no, uh, the UN Security Council will not be able to overrule the International Court of Justice. Now, there is a process by which a nation can postpone it or somehow stop the thing from happening, uh, which of course Israel won't be able, won't be uh, allowed to do because they're the, fuck, they're the nation that's being uh, will be considered for sanction. Uh, but the United States could still do that. However, um, with them stating that the United States has put themselves already in the position by running around saying this is, this is, th there is no genocide, ergo South Africa has no uh, cause to bring this action to the ICJ. Um, once this decision is made by the ICJ, if it's favorable for South Africa, which I can't imagine it won't be, um, the United States, that puts the United States in a difficult position. They're already putting themselves out there saying that this has to stop, this military action has to stop, and there has to be a two-state solution. We discussed that in my last video about this yesterday. Anthony Blinken has already come forward, I think partly because they had this position staked out with that Wall Street Journal op-ed that I talked about over a, well over a month ago. They had this position staked out. It would be very difficult for the Biden administration to come forward. They can... They can veto resolutions in the UN Security Council until, until the cows come home, and they have done so forever on behalf of Israel. Um, and people won't really spend as much time thinking about it as they will when there's an ICJ ruling stipulating that Israel's actions are setting the, setting the table for genocide in in Gaza. And then the United States comes forward and says, oh, we're going to push that out of the way. We're going to ignore that ruling. That'll be a very difficult position for the United States. But that's what's at stake here. Just, just so you know, that's what they're looking for. Uh, I'm not going to interrupt her again. I'm going to let her make her argument and you can listen to it on its merits and you can make your own decisions. The UN statistics that are relied upon are up to date as of 9 January 2024. In South Africa's oral submissions, we will illustrate the facts that we rely on with limited use of audiovisual material. Madam President, we do so with restraint and only where necessary and always with respect to the Palestinian people. Against this background, I move now to demonstrate, in turn, how Israel's conduct violates Articles 
2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D of the Convention. The first genocidal act committed by Israel is the mass killing of Palestinians in Gaza in violation of Article 2A of the Genocide Convention. As the UN Secretary General explained five weeks ago, the level of Israel's killing is so extensive that nowhere is safe in Gaza. As I stand before you today, 23,210 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces during the sustained attacks over the last three months. At least 70% of whom are believed to be women and children. Some 7,000 Palestinians are still missing, presumed dead under the rubble. Palestinians in Gaza are subjected to relentless bombing wherever they go. They are killed in their homes, in places where they seek shelter, in hospitals, in schools, in mosques, in churches, and as they try to find food and water for their families. They have been killed if they fail. Huh. Okay. I do not know what this is. Sorry, folks. To evacuate in the places to which they have fled, and even while they attempted to flee along Israeli declared safe routes. The level of killing is so extensive that those whose bodies are found are buried in mass graves, often unidentified. In the first three weeks alone, following 7 October, Israel deployed 6,000 bombs per week. At least 200 times it has deployed 2,000 pound bombs in southern areas of Palestine designated as safe. These bombs have also decimated the north, including refugee camps. 2,000 pound bombs are some of the biggest and most destructive bombs available. They are dropped by lethal fighter jets that are used to strike targets on the ground by one of the world's most resourced armies. Israel has killed an unparalleled and unprecedented number of civilians with the full knowledge of how many civilian lives each bomb will take. More than 1,800 families, Palestinian families in Gaza, have lost multiple family members and hundreds of multi-generational families have been wiped out with no remaining survivors. Mothers, fathers, children, siblings, grandparents, aunts, cousins, often all killed together. This killing is nothing short of destruction of Palestinian life. It is inflicted deliberately no one is spared, not even newborn babies. The scale of Palestinian child killings in Gaza is such that UN chiefs have described it as a graveyard for children. The devastation we submit is intended, is intended to and has laid waste to Gaza beyond any acceptable legal, let alone humane, justification. The second genocidal act identified in South Africa's application is Israel's infliction of serious bodily or mental harm to Palestinians in Gaza 
in violation of Article 2B of the Genocide Convention. Israel's attacks have left close to 60,000 Palestinians wounded and maimed. Again, the majority of them women and children. This in circumstances where the healthcare system has all but collapsed. I return to this later in my speech. Large numbers of Palestinian civilians, including children, are arrested, blindfolded, forced to undress, and loaded onto trucks taken to unknown locations. The suffering of the Palestinian people, physical and mental, is undeniable. Turning to the third genocidal act under Article 2C, Israel has deliberately imposed conditions on Gaza that cannot sustain life and are calculated to bring about its physical destruction. Israel achieves this in at least four ways. First, by displacement. Israel has forced, forced the displacement of about 85% of Palestinians in Gaza. There is nowhere safe for them to flee to. Those who cannot leave or refuse to be displaced have either been killed or at extreme risk of being killed in their homes. Many Palestinians have been displaced multiple times as families are forced to move repeatedly in search of safety. Israel's first evacuation order on 13 October required the evacuation of over one million people, including children, the elderly, the wounded, and infirm. Entire hospitals were required to evacuate even newborn babies in intensive care. The order required them to evacuate the north to the south within 24 hours. The order itself was genocidal. It required immediate movement, taking only what could be carried, while no humanitarian assistance was permitted, and fuel, water, and food, and other necessities of life had deliberately been cut off. It was clearly calculated to bring about the destruction of the population. For many Palestinians, the forced evacuation from their homes is inevitably permanent. Israel has now damaged or destroyed an estimated 355,000 Palestinian homes, leaving at least half a million Palestinians with no home to return to. The Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons explains that houses and infrastructure, quote, have been razed to the ground, frustrating any realistic prospects for displaced Gazans to return home, repeating a long history of mass forced displacement of Palestinians by Israel. There is no indication at all that Israel accepts responsibility for rebuilding what it has destroyed. Instead, the destruction is celebrated by the Israeli army. Soldiers film themselves joyfully detonating entire apartment blocks and town squares, erecting the Israeli flag over the wreckage, seeking to re-establish Israeli settlements on the rubble of Palestinian homes, and thus extinguishing the very basis of Palestinian life in Gaza. Second, together with the forced displacement, Israel's conduct has been deliberately calculated to cause widespread hunger, dehydration, and starvation. Israel's campaign has pushed Gazans to the brink of famine. An unprecedented 93% of the population in Gaza is facing crisis levels of hunger. Of all the people in the world currently suffering catastrophic hunger, more than 80% are in Gaza. 
The situation is such that the experts are now predicting that more Palestinians in Gaza may die from starvation and disease than airstrikes. And yet Israel continues to impede the effective delivery of humanitarian assistance to Palestinians, not only refusing to allow sufficient aid in, but removing the ability to distribute it through constant bombardment and obstruction. Just three days ago, on 8 January, a planned mission by UN agencies to deliver urgent medical supplies and vital fuel to a hospital and medical supply center was, was denied by Israeli authorities. This marked the fifth denial of a mission to the center since 26 December, leaving five hospitals in northern Gaza without access to life-saving medical supplies and equipment. Aid trucks that are allowed in are seized upon by the hungry. What is provided is simply not enough. Madam President, members of the court, this is an image of an aid truck arriving in Gaza. Israel has deliberately inflicted conditions in which Palestinians in Gaza are denied adequate shelter, clothes, or sanitation. For weeks, there have been acute shortages of clothes, bedding, blankets, and critical non-food items. Clean water is all but gone, leaving far below the amount required to safely drink, clean, and cook. Accordingly, the WHO has stated that Gaza is experiencing soaring rates of infectious disease outbreaks. Cases of diarrhea in children under five years of age have increased 2,000% since hostilities began. When combined and left untreated, malnutrition and disease create a deadly cycle. The Fourth Genocidal Act under Article 2B is Israel's military assault on Gaza's healthcare system, which renders life unsustainable. Even by 7 December, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health noted that the healthcare infrastructure in the Gaza Strip has been completely obliterated. Those wounded by Israel in Gaza are being deprived of life-saving medical care. Gaza's healthcare system, already crippled by years of blockade and prior attacks by Israel, is unable to cope with the sheer scale of the injuries. Finally, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls has pointed to acts committed by Israel that would fall under the, cat under the fourth category of genocidal acts in Article 2D of the Convention. On 22 November, she expressly warned the following. The, rep the reproductive violence inflicted by Israel on Palestinian women, newborn babies, infants, and children could be qualified as acts of genocide under Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, including imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group. Israel is blocking the delivery of life-saving aid including essential medical kits for delivering babies in circumstances where an estimated 180 women are giving birth in Gaza each day. Of these 180 women, the WHO warns that 
are likely to experience pregnancy or birth-related complications and need additional medical care. That care is simply not available. In sum, Madam President, all of these acts, individually and collectively, form a calculated pattern of conduct by Israel, indicating a genocidal intent. This intent is evident from Israel's conduct in specially targeting Palestinians living in Gaza, using weaponry that causes large-scale homicidal destruction, as well as targeting, sni targeted sniping of civilians, designating safe zones for Palestinians to seek refuge, and then bombing these, depriving Palestinians in Gaza of basic needs, food, water, healthcare, fuel, sanitation, and communications, destroying social infrastructure, homes, schools, mosques, churches, hospitals, and killing, seriously injuring, and leaving large numbers of children orphaned. Genocides are never declared in advance. But this court has the benefit of the past 13 weeks of evidence that shows incontrovertibly a pattern of conduct and related intention that justifies a plausible claim of genocidal acts. In the Gambia Myanmar case, this court did not hesitate to impose provisional measures in relation to allegations that Myanmar was committing genocidal acts against the Rohingya within the Rakhine state. The facts before the court today are sadly even more stark and like the Gambia Myanmar case, deserve and demand this court's intervention. Every day, there is mounting irreparable loss of life, property, dignity, and humanity for the Palestinian people. Our news feeds show graphic images of suffering that has become unbearable to watch. Nothing will stop the suffering except an order from this court. Without an indication of provisional measures, the atrocities will continue, with the Israeli Defense Force indicating that it intends pursuing this course of action for at least a year. In the words of the UN Under Secretary General on 5 January 2024, I quote, you think getting aid into Gaza is easy? Think again. Three layers of inspections before trucks can even enter. Confusion and long queues. A growing list of rejected items. A crossing point meant for pedestrians, not trucks. Another crossing point where trucks have been blocked by desperate, hungry communities a destroyed commercial sector, constant bombardments, poor communications, damaged roads, convoys shot at, damaged delays at checkpoints, a traumatized and exhausted population crammed into a smaller and smaller sliver of land, shelters which have long exceeded their full capacity, aid workers themselves displaced, killed. This is an impossible situation for the people of Gaza and for those trying to help them. The fighting must stop." Close quote. Madam President, members of the court, that concludes my section on the genocidal conduct of Israel. I thank you for your patient attention. And I ask that you call Advocate Muka Tobi to the podium to address the court on genocidal intent. I think.
Okay. That was her presentation on the genocidal conduct uh, of Israel. Hang on a second. I'm going to post this so you guys can watch it. Uh, of course, there are links to this as well as to uh, their 84-page application, which uh, she is referring to, which this whole thing is based on. And uh, 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 she gave a, a powerful, in my opinion, uh, argument. Um, and I, I, it is, I think, uh, I guess, um, uh, it is, we will see how Israel tries to respond to this. Um, but there is no question. You can see it every day. You, we understand it. We can hear them talking about it every day. We can hear the ones outside like Ben Giver and others uh, talking about from the Jewish power fucking party. Um, clearly, this is a genocide. And clearly, it must stop. Um, Again, I will post other videos uh, of, of the presentation later. Uh, but I thank you for your time.